hello fellow youtubers I was just writing a letter to my sister today and I'm all I'm seeing is, is new subscriber new subscriber popping up on the screen so I just like to say a big holy cow thank you um, I'm just posting this video basically because I want to open a section called Stargate uh, you can only open a section if you have a video to put in this section so I'll post this video so I can open a section on this channel called Stargate and then I can start putting Stargate clips in there uh, on this one I think um, I'll put some special features on this clip here you know just to make it worth your while you don't want to listen to me rambling on on my stupid little voice so here you go thank you for subscribing this freaking awesome man I love you all A man by the name of John Symes approached me. He was working for MGM. I had worked with John over at Paramount um, during the MacGyver days. And um, John just called me and said, I want you to do this project. And I said, well, what is it? And he said they had, uh, MGM had purchased the rights to the Stargate franchise and that they were developing a series and that he wanted me to be a part of it. Colonel Jack O'Neill? Retired. I'm Major Samuels. I'm, uh, I'm under orders to bring you to see General Hammond, sir. Never heard of him. He replaced General West. He says it's important. It has to do with the Stargate. I told him that, well, you know, if we're going to try and get Rick involved, then um, he's going to have to have a lot more leeway with the character. Uh, because I couldn't really picture Rick playing um, Kurt Russell's uh, O'Neill. In the feature film, Jack O'Neill, uh, who was suicidal in the feature film, and the reason he was suicidal is because his son accidentally killed himself with his own gun. So what we've done is we've covered the fact that the Jack O'Neill character has had that experience. It's a dark part of his past. It actually helps define why he is kind of a, a funny, happy-go-lucky guy all the time. He doesn't really want to go to that dark place where he was when we first met him. They had to be receptive to whatever input, uh, character-wise, that, uh, that I could bring. Because uh, as portrayed by Mr. Russell, it was a little more stoic than I think I'd, I could endure over a long period of time. Where's the fanfare, General? We did kind of save the planet, sir. Again? It should not get old, General. Job well done. Thank you, sir. It was nothing. I had to make sure that they were willing to put up with, well, in this case, endure my sense of humor. Go! Oh. And somehow infiltrated into the character subtly or with a sledgehammer. If we don't find a way out of this soon, I'm gonna lose it. It means go crazy. Nuts. Insane. Bonzo. No longer in possession of one's faculties. Three fries short of a happy meal. What O'Neill's um, uh, demons we brought from the movie to you know the first uh, parts of the first season of, of our show, and that had to do with the, his son and some emotional uh, baggage that he was bringing along with his son having killed himself. Cold Lazarus actually dealt with that and confronted the problems that uh, that he had with those memories. Um, from that point on, he's, he's I've just had fun being um, you know doing a gradual growth process. Your deepest pain was not the physical injury I had caused. Your pain comes from an empty place in your heart where Charlie once was. Charlie's gone. No. He's in here. Charlie. Just as being part of a character and being trying to be credible, uh, and still stretch it and make sure that there there is a again that sense of lightness or, or humor. Um, I put a little bit of irreverence in, um, in the character of O'Neill. The gradual degeneration. It's a lot more fun to play, and I think it's a lot more fun for an audience to watch. It makes it a little more credible and, and humanizes a character a little more. Guys, you getting this? Because this is important. 
I believe it was our first season. I was uh, I got to endure the the rigors of a four and a half, five hour makeup job to age from whatever O'Neill was to, to 100 years old in stages. That was phenomenal experience as an actor because I'd never been able to really hide behind a mask, you know, a mask that just almost made me indistinguishable. That as an actor, uh, it sort of got my attention. Tell me, will you live the rest of your days without making love? Oh God, I hope not. <sighs> Oh, we'd probably just pass out. If you ever want an actor to show up on time, know his lines, and not screw around, make him an executive producer. He'll show up. Make him responsible to the budget. Just so you know, this is a completely staged and prompt meeting. They're rehearsing their uh, ad libs. <laughs> they look serious. I do have to walk the line a little bit because I do know what needs what we need to get filmically to be able to to edit and to, to tell the story. Special <laughs> effects on video. Look. So I'm having to rein in a little bit. He's so great to work with because you know that all your that your beats are going to get hit and he actually you know that he's going to bring more to the show. He'll take a scene and it'll always be, you know, better than you envisioned. Hey. What the hell do you think you're doing? Same thing you do, only better. What does that mean? Better? It means better, stronger, faster. Oh, you little shit. Sirs, <laughs> as much as I'd like to see how this plays out, don't we have something more important to do? You feel lucky that you uh, have someone like Rick and people who we've been able to both cast and hire that raise the bar qualitatively from the page to the screen. Remember hearing that, that uh, you have to dumb down um, material to, to meet the audience, to meet the, the mainstay of the audience, which I thought was one of the more offensive things I'd ever heard about um, reflection about mankind in general. Almost there, sir. This time of year, the direct line between P2X555 and the Earth takes us within 70,000 miles of the sun. I have to update the computer's drift calculation to include gravitational space-time warping. We know that. Let's go. That's ludicrous. I mean, give, give us all some, you know, the benefit of the doubt, if nothing else, but certainly give us some credit for being intelligent beings. Could this beam you mentioned be a means to access the gate's subspace field in order to create some kind of time inversion outside of subspace? I knew you were going to say that. There is intelligence in humor. There's, you know, bring it up and, and maybe, you know, sow the seeds of a grander idea by, um, by thinking in, in a, or speaking in a more lofty way or about more uh, loftier ideas. Don't, you know, dumb it down so a cow could understand it. I said, you know, that's, that's not me. Ryder! Sir, hi. What are you doing? Uh, I'm getting ready to do a detailed analysis of the decay rate of Naquita within the reactor. Ah! I'm on vacation. Yes, sir. I learned a lot from Rick. Um, he has a saying, uh, you know, we'll be talking about something in a meeting and he'll and, and I remember, the first time he said, I don't remember what we were talking about, but the first time he said it, he says, uh, LTS. Life's too short. If it's not fun, it's not worth doing anymore. Write that down somewhere. His philosophy basically is he's not going to do it if it's going to be a painful thing. He wants the set to be a pleasurable place. He wants everybody to be comfortable and happy and uh, if everything's going to be miserable, Let's not do it, is his attitude. And, and I think that's a great attitude. I love that. He's just a genuine guy, you know? There's no ego about him. There's no bravado. And there's so much opportunity for there to be that. I suppose you expect my male bravado to kick in right about now. I've read your file. No mention of bravado, eh? He's got this goofy sense of humor. Sometimes he's like an eight-year-old. Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise. I enjoy the look on Rick's face anytime there's going to be a lot of explosions or anytime there's going to be a lot of gunfire. You know, he turns into this 14-year-old. Jack of the Windy City. Sometimes he's like a 16-year-old. Afternoon, ma'am. 
I'm Mr. Starsky. This is Hutch. I've never seen him really get beyond 18. I'll be honest with you, Bob. My name's not Kirk. It's Skywalker. Luke Skywalker. This is, you know, a little aside here, but I, I saw him for the first time this season. Uh, we'd been away on a hiatus for three months, and I was coming around the parking lot, and I saw him, and I forgot how damn handsome he is. And I was disarmed for a moment, which surprised me after four years that I could turn a corner and go, oh, yeah, I work with him. <laughs> Lucky me. Colonel. Uh... Have a good time. Land of sky blue waters, loofahs. Yeah, sure you betcha, Snookums. I like the family, and I like the, you know, if things are well oiled as uh, as they are around here, then it's a joy to come to work. And it's a great venue to tell good stories. <laughs>